Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. This is Megan Raymond with WCET. You've joined us for the session, Recovery with Equity, Developing a Post-Pandemic Roadmap for Higher Education. And there's a few ways that you can participate with us today. If you use the feed loop chat, go ahead and indicate if you have a question by putting a, a question mark right before the, the question so that when we sort through, it's easy to identify where your questions are. But please feel free to jump in and share resources or post any comments in the chat. And I'll be making sure to share that with our, our wonderful moderator today. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I'll pass it off to Monica Lozano, our moderator, and also a, a, a discussant today. So Monica. Thank you, Megan, and welcome everybody to this panel, Recovery with Equity, Developing a Post-Pandemic Roadmap for Higher Education. We're gonna spend the next hour or so talking with a group of experts and also members of the task force that developed this roadmap to help us better understand the process that they went through, thinking about not recovering to what we had before in the systems of public higher education in California, but how we actually use this moment as an opportunity to rethink, redesign, and to center equity and student success in the future of California's post-secondary institutions. So I wanna welcome our panelists. I'll go by alphabetical order, depending on where you are on the Zoom. And so starting with Nathan Brostrom. Nathan is with the University of California Office of the President. He's the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Um, Judy Sakaki. Judy is the president of Sonoma State University and has had a very long and distinguished career in public higher education. And Michael Wayfin. Michael was at the time in the task force, um, the student representative to the uh, CSU, the California State University Students Association, and is now a graduate student at UC Berkeley. So. Wonderful to have you all. My name is Monica Lozano and I will be your moderator. I was also a member of the task force and am currently the president of College Futures Foundation. So the way that we're gonna go about this is I'm going to present a very high level, um, a summary of both the work of the task force and the recommendations that have come out of it. Then I'll lead us through a discussion with our three panelists and then we'll open it up to discussion with the audience. So Megan, if we could go to, great. So as I, as I said, um, this was, we can actually go back to the, to the earlier slide because I do want to give a, a little bit of background. So recovery for all, um, California for All, Recovery with Equity, a Roadmap for Higher Education, the California Governor's Council. There's actually quite a bit on this cover slide. And I wanted to make sure that we put the work of this um, task force in the broader context of the governor's vision, California for All, and the work of a body, an advisory body, that he convened the California Governor's Council for Post-Secondary Education. This work was actually chaired by then Senior Advisor for Higher Education to the Governor, Senior Advisor to the Governor for Higher Education, Dr. Lande Jose. but Lande has since moved on, and so it's my task and my pleasure to present the findings and to um, moderate this panel. So we can go to the next slide. And we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. So, so as I said, let me, let me put this in context because I think it's, it's absolutely essential when you think about um, the, the boldness of the recommendations, the way in which this group came together in order to advance recommendations that were then embraced by the governor of the state of California as well as the segment leaders. And so it was actually back when um, Governor Newsom had just been elected, he was still governor-elect, it was 2018, when he, understanding how important the role of public higher education is to the future well-being of the state of California, he convened the Governor's Council for Post-Secondary Education, which is made up of all of the segment leaders, from the community colleges, the CSU, the UC, so the presidents of all of those, the independent sector, the AICCU, 
as well as advisors from the Department of Finance, um, the business community, as well as the labor community. And the idea is that this group would advise him on considering options by which California could stitch together its commitment to higher education, as well as its commitment to inclusive economic growth. And so it is this council that really um, gave birth to the work of the Recovery with Equity Task Force. If we go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, um, coming through the pandemic, it was 2020 when the Governor's Council, as I said, made up of the system leaders in the midst of, you know, one of the most challenging moments of its time, and, and President Sakaki um, can talk to that, but really in triage. And at the same time was asking itself, we know that we need to do what we can to support our students in this moment, but can we actually also use this moment to begin to contemplate ways in which we can pull out of this in a way where our systems are more integrated, are more resilient, and certainly much more equity focused, and using all of the innovation that comes out of higher education to really think about systems redesign. So it was in this context of the pandemic that opened up a window for this task force to come together to really say, how do we do things differently? This is not about recovery, it is about reimagining and then reinventing. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the task force um, actually prepared what we consider a roadmap for higher education post-pandemic. Um, it is a series of, of research findings. It has 10 very actionable interrelated recommendations, each that lay out what are the policy and practice changes needed to implement them, as well as what are the resource, resources needed. And then we identified ways in which policymakers, education leaders, other stakeholders could together collaboratively think about ways in which we can bring these recommendations to life and make them actionable and practical. And as we said, more resilient, more equitable for the state of California. So let me go through, if you go to the next slide, Megan. Um, the, the fundamental principle of this task force, um, which is that we are not going back to the way things were, that we have to learn from this experience. We have to use it as a motivator to challenge ourselves, to address the inequities and to build on the assets, the great assets of the state of California that allow us to reimagine the future. So if we can go on to the next slide, Megan, we'll go through these relatively, relatively quickly. So if you go to the next one, please. Okay, so how did, we, how did we arrive at these recommendations? And I should say that the task force was made up of um, experts from both within California, as well as national experts, um, people who are doing extraordinary things in other states that we could learn from. Um, but we were also very informed by data, by analysis, by what is already in the field, by what individuals like yourselves have been doing and dedicating yourself to, but we also understood that we could not, with a good conscience, actually submit a report where we hadn't deliberately listened and engaged with the most important stakeholders. So as you can see by this um, slide here, um, interviews and focus groups with almost 200 individuals across all sectors, the vast majority, Michael will talk to this, for students themselves to really understand what is the lived experience of students? What are the challenges? What are the barriers? How do we actually use um, all of our resources to address those and to remove them permanently? We brought in workforce partners. We, we, we talked to our K-12 partners. We talked to industry and business leaders. We talked to government and, and other um, public sector leaders. So this was really meant to be informed, not just as a set of recommendations about higher education, but higher education as a system within a broader social system. One that has to reach down to our K-12 and early childhood partners, and one that has to reach out and understand the obligation that we have to deliver students 
into an opportunity uh, for um, economic success, social mobility, and true progress for themselves, their families, and their communities. So if we go to the next slide, please. So the findings, and, and all of you who are on this call, you do this work every day, so it may not be surprising, but it certainly was validating what we had heard over and over and over again. Our first generation, our low income, our Latinx, our black, our indigenous students, those who were the majority of the student population in our public higher, higher um, high schools are less likely to finish high school, are less likely to complete A through G. And, and as we know, um, one of the reasons is because A through G is not default curriculum in the state of California. So um, it is not equally distributed. And these are the same students that are less likely to enroll in and to graduate, unfortunately with a post-secondary credential or degree. Megan, if you wanna move on, thank you. And so why is that? These are the things that we heard from our students. Um, and, and again, what we've been hearing over and over again for the last two years, um, there's insufficient financial aid, there isn't support for students' basic needs, um, we all understand um, the burden that students have to carry when it comes to textbooks or childcare or transportation, um, housing, food. So all of the things that contribute to a successful completion, our financial aid system is insufficient and the supports are insufficient. It is also very complicated to navigate from one segment to another. The vast majority of those students that we just talked about will start off in a community college. And while they go in with almost 80% with an aspiration to transfer into a four-year institution, less than 30% do. And why is that? Because it's hard to navigate because the process is not clear from how you actually move from a two-year um, community college into a four-year. The lack of cohesion across the segments, whether it be K-12 into higher ed, or even among the um, three higher public education systems, course availability, capacity issues, um, and, and, and the lack of a data system in the state of California um, that would otherwise allow us to actually identify, track, and support students. So um, when we talk about technology, this is one of the, the, the clear mandates, which is to have um, a cradle to career data system that supports um, the, the individuals and residents of California. Megan? We can go on to the recommendations. So we're gonna go through these quickly in terms of the PowerPoint because this, this will actually be the bulk of the conversation. But, um, like all um, important projects, um, you, you start off by what are your guiding principles? You've received the data, you understand the circumstances, you have an idea of what you, where you, where you wanna go, which is a more resilient, a more integrated, a more equitable public higher education system. And, and the task force came up with these four guiding principles. That number one, we need to foster an inclusive institution that it is about the culture and the approach that institutions take to teaching and learning that welcomes individuals like ourselves, that give us a sense of belonging, that says you are welcome here. So fostering inclusive institutions, streamlining the pathway to degrees, which is what I had just said. It is, it is, it is a very circuitous um, system that you have to navigate. So how do we actually create and use technology to create a more integrated um, and, and easy to navigate um, pathway for students. Facilitating transitions, um, using technology, what we call, as, as you all know, high touch, high tech. And when are they appropriately deployed in order to facilitate and support student transitions? And then simplifying the supports for student st stability. Um, one of the things that we heard over and over again is that if I need financial aid, I go here. If I need counseling, I go there. If I need a transportation voucher, I go someplace else. So how do we actually create a system that operates like a system to support students on their, on their educational journey? And the next slide, please. 
So out of the four guiding principles, we came up with 11 recommendations. And all of these recommendations are meant to be interconnected. They're meant to support each other. Um, they're meant to be comprehensive. And, and it is a significant task that is in front of us for those of us who, who care about public higher education and are committed to it here in the state of California. Um, but as you can see, everything from improving faculty and staff diversity, um, for all the reasons that we know, we'll get into that, cultivating these equity-oriented learning environments, retaining students through inclusive supports, establishing an integrated admissions platform, streamlining the admissions process. Um, so how do you actually apply and get admitted in a way that, that makes it easy and is also um, less financially burdensome for our students? A common course numbering system, which I know that we're gonna talk about seems um, so practical but California has been unable to actually present, um, implement a common course numbering system uh, between campuses and across segments, high tech, high touch advising, um, college prep and early credit, dual enrollment as an example, um, an integrated platform for state services for students, um, internet access. How many times did we hear that it wasn't the lack of a device, it was the lack of connectivity. Um, and California, unfortunately, um, as, as progressive as we are, still has huge pockets um, where families and, and individuals um, don't have access. Um, and then of course, the college affordability question. So four guiding principles, 11 recommendations. Um, and if you wanna go to the next slide, Megan. Um, one of the things that we wanted to just mention here, and then I'm gonna just go quickly because um, what we wanted to do was to also demonstrate to all of you who are watching that these are not sitting on shelves. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, there is a deep commitment from the governor's office, from the segment leadership, from individuals like those who are on this panel to say, um, this is time for us to take these recommendations and do something about it. And the segment leaders, the President Drake of the UC, Joe Castro from the CSU, um, uh, Daisy Gonzalez, who's the interim uh, chancellor at the California Community Colleges, as well as Kristen Suarez, who runs the Independent College Association. Um, all four of them agreed, our number one priority is, is addressing student basic needs. And they are working right now on a task force. If you wanna to go to the next slide and then we'll close with this. Um, they are taking these policy recommendations and actually designing a system that is intersegmental, student-centered and cost-effective where in fact um, students are able to enroll um, in, in various, um, across various agencies um, to be able to, and segments to be able to meet their basic needs. So just wanted to give that to you as an example of, of the willingness that you'll find in California to do things differently. So Megan, um, I think we can bring down the, thank you, wonderful. There everybody is. It's good to see you all, thank you. Um, so I hope that was useful. And of course there is a website and it's in your materials and, and we can um, put in the chat later where you can actually get a copy of the report and the recommendations. But um, let's go ahead and open this up to, to discussion now. And we wanted to start with the four guiding principles and to, to really understand um, as you, you as task force members, um, what you meant by these guiding principles, what it was that um, motivated you or um, affirmed the importance of these. And so the first guiding principle, of course, is fostering inclusive institutions. And what's wonderful about this particular panel is that we have Nathan, who represents a system, uh, Judy Sakaki, president of a campus, and then Michael, who brings to us the perspective of the ultimate individual we're here to serve, which is the student. Um, so fostering inclusive institutions, um, what is it that, that you're doing, Nathan, or how did you actually take this back to the office of the president and um, think about what you're currently doing, what you might want to do differently? Thanks, Monica. And uh, it's great to be here with, with all of you, and especially my, my dear friends, uh, Monica and Judy and, and, and Michael. It's great to, to see all of you again. Um, you know, in some ways, I think this is the, one of the most important um, uh, principles we have is how do we create institutions that not only welcome all of our students, but also uh, ones where they persist and they uh, actually complete their, their education. 
it's uh, not enough just to uh, let students in the door, but to make sure that we are creating the environment that will uh, uh, support them in their, in their time. Um, so we have lots of uh, uh, system-wide uh, efforts. Um, uh, you know, the presidential uh, postdoc um, uh, initiative, uh, we have partnerships which, with HBCUs and other minority serving institutions um, to try to diversify our, our pipeline. Uh, one I might speak to, uh, uh, in addition to being the system-wide CFO, I spent a wonderful year as the interim chancellor at, at UC Merced. And for those who don't know, um, Merced is our youngest campus. It's just been uh, part of the UC system since 2005. It is um, our most diverse campus. Um, uh, three quarters of the students are first generation, two thirds are Pell students. And one of the real, real challenges there is to uh, try to get their graduation rates, their retention rates up to um, those of um, our, our other UC campuses. And we found a lot of um, uh, very positive efforts towards uh, uh, retention. And a lot of it really is, you know, shrinking the size of the campus. Um, uh, one of the easiest ways was housing. We actually require students to live on campus for, for two years. And just by requiring them to be on campus, retention rates go up um, significantly. Um, also just shrinking the campus by, um, uh, you know, giving, making them part of smaller communities, living learning communities, uh, where they have a cohort of students who support them uh, their, um, uh, their whole time on campus. Um, one of the biggest predictors of retention and graduation is actually undergraduate research. And it actually works pretty well at Merced because their graduate population is not as large as other campuses. So undergraduates get a lot of opportunities for uh, research. And this not only uh, keeps them on campus, you know, there is a professor expecting them to be in a lab at four o'clock on a, on a Tuesday, but, you know, for them to come back uh, in, in the fall. And uh, interestingly, it also diversifies our pipeline towards graduate school and the professoriate because um, uh, Merced is second only to UC Berkeley in terms of the number of its undergraduates who go on to academic careers. And a lot of that is because they've had this experience uh, as undergraduates that they may not have gotten at a a bigger, more anonymous um, uh, institution. So uh, I think this is core to our, our mission and we are looking at things both uh, system-wide but also uh, campus by campus. Judy, did you wanna add? You know, I, I think very much so the same notion of a smaller campus. I've been on different size campuses and the fact that I landed at Sonoma State, which is one of 23, one of the 23 campuses of the California State University, how do you take an initiative like building, like what we have here, take a principle like this to foster inclusive institutions? How do I spread, we spread that across the 23 campuses? And so these recommendations and these findings were presented. Um, this roadmap was presented to our uh, board of trustees of our system. And then I've made myself available to the other presidents, my 22 other colleagues, to talk about what we accomplished here and how we can be helpful and supportive of each other. And then within, and I'll leave that for the implementation, but I do think that one of this is how do you take, which is, with a state as diverse and large as California, with different um, campuses having different um, di percentages of diverse students, whether they're first generation or whether they're Pell eligible, how do you make all of our institutions more welcoming to the diversity of students in the state of California so that we are not re just regional institutions, but that we serve the diversity of California? And that's something that I've been very uh, interested in as my campus is in a part of California that is less diverse in some of the urban um, inner cities. So I'll stop there, turn it over to Michael. You've got some great student insights. Great. Well, thank you. And, and uh, also second what all of you have been saying around thinking about our campus culture. Um, I engage with students quite a bit. And as Monica mentioned, I, I led the statewide student association, uh, working with students across the CSU and intersegmentally with the UC and community college. And I think one thing that I, I make sure I, I tell every student leader that I run into is this is a particular moment, an opportunity to where you have the ability to shape the culture uh, and the feeling that your students get when they walk on campus. Um, this is one time 
actually one of the only times probably you'll ever get where uh, about half the student body or maybe even more than that, possibly a little bit less, have never stepped foot on campus before to take classes. And so that you have this moment where you can implement new policies, you can start new practices, you can create new cultures that make students want to come back the next day. Um, I, I caught a little bit of flack for this when I was a student leader, but I, I once said in a room full of faculty that, you know, your, your class might be interesting, but it might not be what brings your student back uh, the next day or the next week. It, it might be their friends. It might be their mentors. Uh, it, it might be their, their student organization. And so how do you kind of bake these things into the student experience to where they're able to find mentors that aren't uh, that that they that they wouldn't run into normally? One of my uh, favorite mentors that I had on campus uh, at San Diego State randomly introduced himself to me in the hallway of a building I never walk into. I was in there for the first time, got his business card, and that was, you know, uh, that was very organic. And students didn't have that opportunity during the pandemic. And so how do you hyper-focus into that um, uh, as a campus culture of mentorship, um, of being inclusive, of being in the classroom and setting kind of a new norm for how you treat each other? It's not only about staff and administration. Sometimes in, in class, a student could say something to another student that makes them feel unwelcome or makes them feel like higher education isn't meant for them particularly for our, our, our first generation uh, and students of color. And so when we think about creating inclusive institutions, it, it goes also with uh, the, the culture of the campus, making sure that it looks like the student body, uh, that the student body feels like they're being represented in their leaders, but are also able to learn from them in a way that doesn't present itself in the curricula. I think there's a lot more I could say on that, but I don't want to take up too much time because um, we have so much more to get to. I just have one more question as it relates to this particular guiding principle. And, you know, because we are talking about, um, you know, something um, that sometimes is, is difficult to, to define like campus culture, Michael, one of the recommendations and any of you can take this was actually to use research-based metrics for evaluating campus climate and then setting goals around those, um, whether it be the sense of belonging, the experiences of discrimination or harassment, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, perceptional issues. And Nathan, I'm gonna turn to you because um, I, I didn't mention this to the audience. I, I had served on the board of the UC, um, the UC Board of Regents um, and worked with Nathan um, very closely and campus climate was something that we spent a lot of time on, but actually setting a bar, evaluating, you know, baseline and then setting metrics. I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, and Monica is being too humble. She was actually the chair of our board at a very uh, propitious time, so uh, and was really a champion for all of these these efforts. Um, I think actually uh, using um, evidence based um, uh, metrics to uh, drive our our campuses is really um, uh, important. Um, as um, uh, as Monica and, and Judy know, and we have had the UQ study that has gone on for. 25 years or so uh, that, that UCLA does. And it's, it's really interesting to see because it does, you know, it captures a lot about curriculum, a lot about time to degree, a lot about, um, uh, you know, other changes, but it also, it, it does capture a, um, a sense of belonging and, and students uh, who self-identify are, uh, you know, will um, uh, share what, what they feel. And, and so you can see longitudinally um, uh, what's happening both on specific campuses and then within um, uh, specific groups. And that enables, uh, you know, the campus leaders to go in and, and, and try to address that and to um, uh, take it head on. I mean, otherwise I think it becomes uh, a little too amorphous. And this gives us some, uh, some real data points that we can use in, in guiding both our resources and then the, um, uh, the efforts we put into it. You know, and I think to piggyback on that, it's so important for the campus leadership the leadership team to signal to the campus that campus climate matters and that diversity matters. And it means not only doing a survey if your campus has never had a survey done before, but it's the leadership championing those and saying why they feel it's important. And our campus, for example, this past year, even during the pandemic, we did our very first comprehensive campus climate survey and we did that along with a couple other of our sister campuses and we will use that as baseline data to help us as we move forward to improve our institutional inclusive um, sense of who we are and how we want to better serve and improve what we're doing. And I'll just, if I can. Oh, no, please, Michael. No, please. 
I was just, I was just going to round it out and add that, you know, uh, data driven and having goals is extremely important because it shows that something can be done. And I think sometimes surveys are administered by different, you know, campus entities. And as a student, you take a survey and then poof, you'll never hear about it again. And so having something that, you know, kind of has a level of accountability that shows to the survey taker that there is going to be something done about this. Like, you don't have to do this one in silence. You don't have to do this one in silence. And I think that this is a conversation better had in the open. Great, thank you. And I, I was going to put Judy on the spot because we didn't talk about this earlier, but I know that College Futures Foundation is actually working with the CSU at some um, very specific campuses to actually bring this data down to the classroom level where instructors are also seeing the data as it relates to um, the success of their students and whether or not there's any um, disparity by um, type of student or student population subgroup. And you know, that makes such a difference to bring people along with you. You can have a great idea, but you also need to bring people along, not just campus leaders, but the general campus, the staff and faculty at large, as well as students to say, this is what the data can show, not to shine a light or not to say, oh, you're, you're not doing quite as well as your other uh, colleague over here, but to say, we want to help lift everyone. And by lifting your class, you will lift a certain segment of the campus population that we haven't been able to touch. And so that data and that information down into uh, classrooms or departments really, really is helpful. Most people, I think, really in their hearts, they want to do better, but if you have the data, it can make it much easier. So, so thank you, yes, Monica. Yes, of course. And the next guiding principle actually is, is very related to the use of data and technology, and it has to do with streamlining the pathways to degrees. Um, and one of the recommendations was an integrated statewide admissions platform. And I know that there's um, some, um, there's been reactions to whether or not that is um, uh, doable and, and to really understand what the benefits would be, but certainly it's something we heard from students, which is, you know, applying to, you know, multiple campuses um, can become, you know, very, very difficult. And knowing that so many of our students are going to transfer out of a community college, um, why not have some sort of a dual admissions process? So. Um, let's take up this, this um, recommendation and, and set of recommendations around an integrated admissions platform, unifying the admissions process, um, and then for you wants who want to know about common course numbering, we can go into um, common course numbering, which actually was just um, legislated uh, by the California State Legislature. I would love to, to start us off here, if I may. Um, uh, kind of around consolidating some of the things that students have to do to get into the university. Uh, if you want to apply to both the CSU and the UC, you're basically putting your information twice. And it's not, it's not easy information like, oh, let me write my name again. It is like, what grade did you receive in your freshman year English class? Like, you know, the, the type of stuff that you have to pull out documents for, you have to double, triple check. But these, these are all data that uh, can be shareable, that students can put in once and be distributed, that we're not doing paper applications anymore, um, that it doesn't need to be kind of this process that tends to honestly block students along the way. Um, I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to apply to so many colleges and then doing one application and thinking, you know what, maybe I can limit my list a little bit because that process on its own was one that, that could push myself away, but even more so students who were not already um, very strictly set on higher education that you can get to the process and immediately think, you know what, this process isn't for me, especially for our first generation students who are applying to college for the first time in their family, don't have that kind of support. I had an older sibling. Uh, my parents also went to college. So it's kind of easier for me to go like, I'm applying. What, is, what does this mean? What does this do? But not all students have that. And so how do you make it so uh, you're not creating a roadblock at the door um, for students to even just just walk in? And I'll, I'll stop there and, and continue the conversation for others. I yeah, I'm like, more, I'm, oh, go ahead, Judy. I'm well, sorry. I think the more that we can streamline this, the easier. Um, you know, I was a first generation college student, so I didn't have my parents to be able to ask, what do I do? Where do I apply? What's the difference between this? What's the difference between a UC and a CSU and a community college? I didn't know. I didn't have people to help me with that. So if we can make it easier for students and to serve 
more of the population of our state. We have some campuses in the state that are just overflowing beyond what their capacity is. And we have other campuses in parts of the state like mine that are less, that have capacity. How do we serve a broader range of students? And we do that if we have an easier streamlined application process so that students can move within institutions, both at the levels, whether it's community college or CSU or UC. And so I think it's something that's helpful. I think what is also helping is that we have legislators who have experienced some of this challenge. And they are now, many of them are first gen um, applicants as well, and they're now seeing. And so to have the legislative support and the governor's office support, I think is why we're seeing now legislation around common course numbering. And of course the influence of this group um, with Londe and the governor's office is really, really helpful. Nathan, go ahead. And Monica, I would just, I, I would echo uh, what uh, Judy and Michael said, but I'd also like to back up because I think the road to college and the road to transfer, as you were saying earlier, really has to start much earlier. And we do not do a good job by our students in terms of, of showing them the options and, you know, and streamlining the, the, the pathways. When, when you were chair, uh, you and um, President Napolitano led the effort to have uh, integrated pathways for, what, 19 of our top 20 majors. Um, and that was, that was good and that was very uh, important. But this is also where technology can play a big role. And um, at College Futures, you funded a lot of the work on Program Mapper, where students as early in community college, but as early as you know, sophomores or juniors in high school can start to map out a career where they would go to a community college and then transfer to a CSU and a UC and take the right courses in the right sequences and not, not lose semesters uh, or prolong their, their time because they haven't uh, followed that. And I think this is one where we're just scratching the surface in terms of, of technology and what it, um, uh, what it enables um, uh, to reach the, um, uh, the students. And I do think then you have to have a combination of you know, technology, which may answer 90% of their questions, but then the warm touch where they don't understand have a, you have um, uh, uh, advising that comes in to help them with uh, um, you know, when, they, when they hit a roadblock or, or need a prompt. Yes, exactly. And, and that, that goes directly to the, to the next guiding principle, Nathan. But before we, we go to the high-tech college advising, um, an integrated admissions and application system. Uh, Nathan, I'm going to ask you, given your role as, the, as CFO and, and the guardian of all resources at the UC, um, is this a question of of deploying capital to support something like this? Is it, does it sit at the state level to do this and require their resources? What would be the roadblocks and how do we overcome them? Well, we, you know, we already have an integrated system for all UC campuses. So as a, uh, applying as an undergraduate to any UC, you use one um, a platform, uh, UC Admit, uh, that, that Judy actually put in place when uh, she was at the office of the, the president. Um, you know, I, I don't think the resources would be that significant uh, to bring in the, the, the CSU uh, campuses. Um, you know, we may have some uh, different uh, expectations around uh, essays or uh, letters or, of reference. We both, neither of us use standardized tests anymore, so that's not an issue. Uh, but that's easy enough to handle through uh, through Toggle. So I don't think it's as uh, as daunting as it as it um, can be made out to be. Um, Judy is more an expert, uh, uh, both in her current role and her past role. But uh, what do you think, President Sakaki? Oops, I think it's very doable. It's just the will and we've been separate. You know, we've been separate entities. But if we could just put students, the student experience first, then we would take away all those barriers and we'd say, let's just do it. Let's roll up our sleeves and figure out between the community colleges and the CSUs and the UCs, let's just do it because it would make it so much better for students and their families. Um, it would just be easier. I think we can overcome those barriers. I'm certainly a strong proponent. And having lived through um, creating the, the UC application system, I just think it's, um, I, I can probably say it's a great system and it's homegrown. And I think for the CSU to come in and the community colleges, I think it would not be that big of a task or stretch. And ironically, when we did it, uh, Judy, if I'm remembering correctly, we actually saved money 
you we know, did. based on the redundant systems across the, the nine campuses. Right. And initially we were trying to outsource it, but we decided to bring it in internally. And I think that um, that did save us some money. And I mean, there were some sleepless nights, but it all worked <laughs> out when we first turned the switch on, you know, but we started um, slowly and um, I'm really proud of that. And I think it is something that that can be um, California statewide for students. Yeah, and 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 I, I think there's a fundamental principle here that you touched on, Judy, which is if we don't, if we if we stop operating from the viewpoint of the institution and convert that into the viewpoint of the student and do what's best for student, we would recognize um, that these systems are inefficient, um, they're costly in terms of time and, and other resources, um, and, and they don't advance. Um, student success. So um, I just heard at least two of our segment leaders saying they're willing to let's just do it, roll up our sleeves and do it. So the next one is um, around facilitating transitions. And Nathan, you started to, to go there where you talked about the program mapper and high tech, high touch. Um, the, the question that I have is in the state of California, this is very much um, led by, and maybe this is for you, Judy, and, and Michael, I'd love to get your thoughts about why this is so important, but it's campus by campus, as opposed to the systems. This seems to me where a systems office should and could say, here's a single technology platform that we know works and can be deployed across all of our campuses, whether it's the 10 UCs or the 23 CSUs, but instead it is campus by campus that is testing, um, different advising um, uh, technologies um, when we understand how important it is. And, and this particular recommendation, um, as you all know, having been on the task force, um, we, 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 we got a big thumbs up from Georgia State, which has rolled this out and um, is using it very, very effectively and efficiently. And so um, I'd love to have you also talk to this question of um, number one, why is it so important? The benefits obviously, um, but then also, and is there a way that we can move to something that is more standardized um, and, and deployed across the systems? You know, I think Monica, you, you raise a really good point. It's something that would be better and easier for students, but each of our campuses developed at different times, right? So some have been in place for 100, 100 years and others may be newer institutions. Um, Nathan spoke about the being at the newest UC um, and across the California State University and community colleges, there are different ages. And when they come on board, as new institutions are forming, each set of faculty or administrators thinks, oh, this is the best new thing. And they develop their own system and then each one is different. I think there's a lot of, lot to be said about now coming together and taking advantage of the technology that's there so students don't have to input what grade they got in their you know freshman English class multiple times it's hard to remember but we have the technology their high school transcripts can be scanned but we make it so challenging for students to have to request their last transcript and then input it match it to what they said and it's, it seems to me that we should use the new technology um, to bet, you know, make it easier for our students and to systematize um, where possible. And I'd offer just a couple of points to um, uh, augment what, uh, what Judy said. Um, you know, first of all, one of the initiatives that the governor is taking on is this cradle to career uh, database. And if that is common to all, uh, not only all three of our systems, but also to K through 12, I think that will be a real game changer in terms of making sure that we all have, you know, the the uh, a common data uh, set, and then we can have modules in terms of um, of monitoring uh, uh, student activity. The other thing that was um, uh, Monica mentioned Georgia State, and we had a presentation of what they did, which was incredibly uh, impressive. Um, but it was it was what I thought was a really a good blend of technology uh, using data. Uh, but then using that to, um, uh, to trigger an intervention or, a, you know, a, a warm handoff. Um, so, you know, I think one of the examples was a student who wanted to be pre-med uh, who um, hadn't signed up for the next uh, course in, in um, uh, chemistry, 
uh, in the chemistry sequence by a certain time. And that triggered a, an advisor to reach out uh, uh, to that student and say, is everything going okay? Or, or what, you know, what can we do to, to support you? And I think it's that combination where you find the right blend of, of technology, which could be done more system-wide or more standardized, but then with an advisor or mentor, or you know, as Michael said, just someone who knows you, who can um, uh, step in. It, it oftentimes is an older student who can step in and uh, you know, just check if everything's okay, because that's the way we're gonna keep students on the campus um, and, and getting degrees. So when I think about uh, advising, it, it takes me back to my early undergrad days before I really knew how a university worked. And, and I remember one day trying to figure out whether I wanted to double major. Um, and so you have your undergraduate advisor, you have your major advisor. I kind of had a minor that I'd signed up for at some point, so I had a minor advisor. If you're involved in some way, you have a student org or you know association advisor. Um, and in order to figure out whether I wanted to double major, it took quite a few hours <laughs> of sitting down with multiple people of one person saying, oh, well, I know that these are the units you're going to have to take during these years, but you're going to have to go talk to that person if you want to figure out what's going to work later down the line. And then running across campus, getting a little sweaty. Okay, talk to this person. They say, I have to talk to you. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, I understand this piece, but that piece, you're going to have to actually schedule a send the email to this person. And we have all of these barriers <laughs> to advising for students to understand just what courses they need to take. Where do they need to go? Who should they talk to? Um, and so I think just putting that into a, a singular place, whether it's at a central office and including some of the updated technology that we know that we have um, and having a way for students to just log in and say, hey, do I need to take this class? Ask a quick question to the bot and get a response right there. You're saving time for the student. You're saving time for, for staff and you're reducing wait times. And I think that this will, this will make things go a lot quicker in, in the long run, not only just experientially, but even just in, in time to get your degree. I think a lot of students take a lot of classes they don't need because they didn't know. Yeah. So um, I know that we're, we're gonna, we've got questions in the chat and, and, and I did wanna go to, um, thank you for that, Michael. Um, the, the last of, of the guiding principles and, and the recommendations of our work, which had to do with simplifying supports um, for students' abilities. And we've talked a little bit about it already, but um, an integrated platform. And it, this one's interesting for state services for students. And, and I recall um, hearing from a number of, of college presidents who said it was you know in the throes of the pandemic and wanting to provide all of the available resources, whether they were campus-based or within, you know, social service agencies that were run through the county. But, you know, students were, you know, having to ping pong between all of these different locations. So there's a, there's a theme here around systematizing, integrating and facilitating um, the, the journey that the student is on. So Michael, why don't we start with you on some of these recommendations, get a couple of quick comments and then we'll take questions from from uh, our audience absolutely and thank you and, and you know this is one of my favorites um so 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 don't mind me uh i really like this one because one of the things that i think gets in a lot of students ways is how many times do you have to tell the university or the state that you're poor and that you need support and so you fill out the FAFSA, you get your Pell Grant. Obviously, that means that you are uh, what the federal government would consider low income, which might mean that you should, especially in California, especially in certain parts, get some housing support, um, have some basic need support, uh, make sure that you're getting resources in, in that way. But the way that it currently stands, you have to apply to all of these things individually, let alone even know that they exist or that you qualify. And so, you know, right now you, you kind of have a way in which students are going around campus and realizing that there's supports available, that they have to apply for them, that sometimes the process is difficult, that again, uh, you're applying to different people, getting different responses. You don't even know who to go to on campus uh, to, to, reach, to reach this. And so putting all of those resources in one spot and, and allowing them to access them in that way, and even having one person to go to with your questions who might be able to answer it kind of, it, it, Inter, intergovernmentally, uh, thinking between counties and maybe lo more local regions in the state, even federal resources, uh, where what they're available, what is available for them in their um, status, like that, that will be immensely helpful. And I could think of so many students um, who, in their senior years, found out that they were, you know, eligible for CalFresher, the California version of, of the food stamp. Um, any uh, Judy or, or Nathan, you want to speak to this, and then I'll. Yeah, I would. I would just agree with Michael. I think this is an area where there are uh, 
uh, ample resources, but we do a very, very poor job of, of simplifying it for, for students who shouldn't have to, you know, have to deal with this when they're 19 or, or, or 20 years old. CalFresh is a very good example. Um, you know, we try to uh, make it easier on the Merced campus for, for students to be able uh, to apply. But it was, as Michael said, filling out uh, multiple forms, actually traveling places where they don't have uh, uh, transportation. Um, and it just, it was never done. Uh, we could never uh, do it at, at scale. So we ended up doing a lot of the basic needs ourselves and doing it uh, or organically. I think we have a big test in this budget because, um, uh, you know, there was a, a very, very um, uh, a big infusion of, of cash for uh, youth and children behavioral health, which will include college students. And so rather than each of us funding student mental health on our own, uh, the state will be involved, but we have to make sure that we get the the, the resources and especially the disparity in resources. Um, you know, as 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 we all know, part of this uh, focus really on the uh, Inland Empire and the uh, Central Valley, where the resources are far more disparate than they are in uh, Greater LA or the or the Bay Area or Sacramento. And um, so, I think uh, this is one we're going to have to watch very uh, closely because there's a lot of uh, money there, but we have to make sure it's getting to uh, the most vulnerable students who uh, who need these services. Great, thank you, Nathan. I'm gonna I'm see if we can get through these questions, and I really appreciate it. so people keep putting them in the chat. Um, and and the first one, if I'm getting it correctly, was in reference to the common application, and yet there are enrollment pressures, and we know that each student enrolled is is um, a resource to a particular campus, so. Um, how do you actually um, put your competitiveness aside um, and do what's right for the student and, and the greater good? And maybe Judy, uh, you can take that question. No, I, th I think it's really just as when a student applies to the University of California, fills out that application, they, they note which campuses they're interested in. The same is true at the CSU. And it would just have a broader drop-down menu of all the different campuses. And I think we should be able to figure out, I didn't get that there's competitiveness, but there's also enough seats where there are students in certain regions that we're not being able to serve. And I think we ought to think about how we get students around, distributed around in places where they can go and be successful. And um, I think the UC and the CSU to some degree where we have students that we can't, cannot be accommodated by a campus where they check off that they want to go. We do um, refer those students and we've had to work out a way that the application fee from that student, right, goes to or helps out the processing at that other campus. It is, I think as to your question, Bridget, there is a competitiveness, but I think if we go back to who are we here for, the students, we will figure that out. We can figure that out in a fair way that will be okay and will service the students that we're here to serve. You know, then the next, and I know Nathan, you probably wanna also, but I collapsed it with the next question, which had to do with, um, you know, credits. Um, it's, it's, it's really was at the core of the common course numbering, which is because, you know, the faculty is determining, you know, what is the curriculum for that particular course. and if um, you know a, a, a course that's got the same name but maybe a different um, syllabus, and so you know all of those issues of you know trying to standardize um, so that in fact it is easier to to develop these systems. Any thoughts about um, how we can make this easier for for students and for the systems? Yeah, I, I would just uh, add on to what Judy was saying. Uh, in all of this, we have to be student focused and do what's right for the students. And so uh, from the applications, uh, you know, one thing that is really well known, especially for first generation students is that it's, it's very common to undermatch. And uh, a lot of that is by not applying to enough schools. And if you apply to more schools, you're more likely to find that you're, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll apply to the, the, the Cal State or the community college that's in your area when it might make more sense to you know, to go to Sonoma State or, or another part of the state. So um, I think we have to keep the students foremost. And that also goes to the uh, curricula. Um, uh, I mean, that was that was what really drove the transfer pathways where you could have taken a, you know, a, a, a physics course at Santa Barbara City College that worked for UC Santa Barbara, but didn't work for UC Davis. And that's just, you know, that, that's... 
uh, you know, that's shameful and that's no service to the, to the students. And so coming up with a physics curriculum that serves all, you know, nine or 32 of the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, four-year schools, I think, is, is really paramount. So we've only got a, a couple of minutes to, to close up and, and I know we, we both wanted to talk about implementation and advice for others in other states that may want to consider putting together a task force to really look at um, student-centeredness, equity and, and redesigning um, systems so that they operate more as a whole. So I'll start, um, I'll go backwards from the alphabetical order and start with Michael. Um, see if you have any final comments um, on any of this. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, hey, what a great conversation this is uh, to be able to talk about it with you all and, and engage in these thoughtful questions. Um, if I had advice and, and something that I, I would love everyone to consider, of course, is to include students in what you do and, and not just in a way that is symbolic, but actually include them as if they were part of the group like your your other colleagues and I say that because I've been part of both where I can tell that I'm there symbolically but they don't actually want to hear what I have to say or what my experience is um and that I've, I've been actually included like in this process where it felt like yeah I my thoughts are also important here and that maybe I don't know all the details like everyone else does or maybe I don't know what happened 15 years ago at an institution that everybody else knows but that the experience is also also important to have at the table um Another thing that I would I, I would push is that, you know, just just in, if the students don't get involved themselves, that doesn't mean that they're not interested. They might just not know. And I think that a lot of the times that that's that's what the case is. I'm, I'm advising students here at UC Berkeley after doing a few years of, of, of student government in undergrad. And I think a lot of the problem is they just don't know. Uh, how some of this works or who to go or, you know, how the money flows or, or how that op operationalizes. And sometimes it's just a matter of telling them. And that just changes the entire dynamic of how that works. Because if you don't include them in the conversation in the first place, I think that's where you get a little bit more of a combative nature uh, later down the road because they feel betrayed or what have you. And so that, that would be my advice to everyone is that, you know, I think that we're, we're all stakeholders at the table and it might be sitting from different perspectives, but, but all have a common goal of creating the best educational system that we can can um, in providing in many degrees to, to as many students as possible, so, uh, among many others. But uh, anyway, thank you all for, for being here and listening in. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Michael. And for everything you've done, your leadership has been extraordinary. Thank you. Judy? You know, this. thank you all for attending this um, session. I think one of the things that I would say as we go forward, I, I learned so much in this process of serving on this group. It was, it was hard work, but it was also fun. But I think what kept it going and what made us so effective was that California Futures helped facilitate the conversations and kept us moving. Um, had me between meetings, had notes, had PowerPoints, had things really moving and it made all the difference. Monica, I've served on so many committees and task forces and we all are so well-meaning, but then you don't have time to actually do some of the heavy lifting, the, the the work. And I just want to thank you for the support because I don't think we could have had this outcome without that. So as you think about doing this in your state or in your region, think about not only the people and having a very broad, both in-state as well as out-of-state uh, folks to help you with perspective, but think about who can be the drivers to do the work between the meetings so that you can be really effective and that there can be long lasting results that won't be just a report that sits on a shelf. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Um, Nathan, last minute is yours. Yeah, I would, I would just close by saying, um, I, I think one other key to the success of this um, uh, uh, Recovery with Equity initiative was that it was convened by the governor and it his, had his top uh, uh, leaders uh, engaged in it. And, you know, Monica talked about the basic needs task force that's already kicked off, uh, but he's also funded a lot of things in, the, um, uh, in his budget uh, that were uh, central to this. So the K through 16 uh, regional collaboratives, uh, you know, came out of a lot of, uh, of work of this group. So, um, you know, engaging, uh, engaging the governor and then also key legislators, I think is also uh, key to the lasting success and the, and the resources ne necessary to implement a lot of these initiatives. And I just want to thank you. It's been great to be here with all of you. Thank you. Megan, did you want to come up? There we go. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, everybody. I took lots of notes and always great to hear from a student and 
good reminder of well, why we are all in this work. So thank you for pulling this together and being part of this conversation. So good luck.